Over the last 10 years, Shopify has grown from a scrappy five-person startup working from a coffee shop and selling snowboarding equipment to a team of over 3,000. Scaling a company like that takes a lot of talented people. And Lindsay Thornton, VP of User Experience at Shopify, has helped grow a multidisciplinary team to take on the challenges of designing products at scale. In this episode of the designbetter.co podcast, we talk with Lindsay about a range of topics, from how do you go about building a pipeline for leadership, to the role a design system plays in helping a growing design team operationalize. We hope you learn as much as we did from the insights that Lindsay has to share, and thanks for listening. Support for Design Better comes from Gusto, who make running a small business easy. Get three months free at gusto.com slash design better once you run your first payroll. Running a small business is hard work, especially all of the payroll, quarterly tax filing stuff, and HR things. I'd rather be focused on my business and my customers than dealing with the administrative duties. But Gusto makes it easy. They automate the complicated parts of running a business. With Gusto, I never miss federal or state payroll tax filings, and I love the time off requests and time tracking tools. Gusto even offers a small group health insurance option for nearly any budget. When you run into issues you need help with, their HR experts are ready to help. It's a very well-designed product, easy to use, and great emotional design that will put a smile on your face. Design Better listeners get three months free once they run their first payroll. Just go to gusto.com slash design better. That's gusto.com slash design better. I've worked with lots of search firms, both as a leader searching for new talent for my teams and as an individual exploring new steps in my career. But I trust none more than Wirt and Company. Since 1995, Wirt and Company has been the design community's most trusted search firm, co-founded by a designer and led by a CEO who has in-house operational startup experience. Wirt and Company is guided by the principle that creative leadership is essential to business success. They've helped some of the most admired brands from early stage startup to Fortune 500 build world-class creative teams. We're talking about companies like Airbnb, The New York Times, The Four Seasons, Notion, Figma, Google, Cartier, and Fair. Not bad. If you're looking for a partner to help you find the right person for a critical role, look no further than Wirt and Company. And if you're looking for your next design leadership role, Wirt and Company will guide you through the process as a friend and a champion throughout your journey. They take the time to get to know you, to understand what you need professionally and personally. Whether you're looking for your next role or your next team member, Wirt and Company can help you find a meaningful relationship. Visit wirtco.com to learn more and get in touch. That's W E R T C O.com. So, Lindsay, um, you've got a really interesting career, and I'm, I want to read a little quote here from an interview. Um, uh, this is probably maybe a year or two old. And you said that there's very little management training that happens part of tech or design degrees. That's part of the reason why so many people struggle later when they're faced with an opportunity to go for a management role. And you yourself, uh, you have a design background, but you went and got your, your MBA. Could you talk a little bit about how that training prepared you for a role as a design leader? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess one of the the biggest probably crisis almost in the design industry at the moment actually is lack of leadership training, ability, confidence, feeling like people can go for it. Um, and for me personally, uh, I did a de- design and technology degree. Um, and at the same time, I was running a cafe at the weekends. I really enjoyed the business aspect of that. Um, But I also realized that I really knew nothing about how the business that I was running at the weekend was run on a larger scale. So um, for me, I had a choice after university, which was, did I want to pursue an animation master's degree or did I want to do an MBA? Um, And I decided that the business aspect of it was more interesting to me. That's what I went for. Um, And while I certainly can't remember any of my corporate finance classes, um, I think the exposure to discussion about business has really uh, lended itself well to my career more generally. Um, and I'm starting to see that more broadly from other designers and, and UX folk in general coming in is some of these skills are really missing in university. Uh, it's something I think we should really address. And 
most tech companies are having to address this on an individual basis. I mean, it's certainly a problem across Shopify, regardless of your discipline. Um, and we address that by having like in-house learning programs for leadership. Um, but it would be great if some of that exposure happened at an earlier stage, for sure. So that's wonderful. So Shopify, obviously, is, is a large company and growing. And as as companies scale and, and, and as teams grow, uh, they often face a challenge of, of their teams reorganizing. What are some of the ways that you dealt with that at Shopify? Yeah, so I think it um, when there's growth, reorganization is an inevitability. It's just a matter of, of when and trying to pick the right time for it. Um, and it's really tricky because what we've certainly found is uh, knowing our rate of growth, which has been a close-ish to 100% a year for the design team for the last five at least years that I've been here, um, you're kind of really trying to plan for what it's going to look like almost a year from now at any point. And that can make it really tricky. It's almost like buying shoes for a toddler. They don't really fit right now. And sometimes it's difficult for people to understand where you're going with the That is the perfect metaphor. <laughs> Having a toddler, I can completely... <laughs> <laughs> the the team is like fumbling along in, in shoes that are a little bit too big for it for a while um, as we like build up the team to kind of fill out the gaps that any sort of reorg exposes and every reorg exposes gaps. So um, that's been one of our and my certainly biggest learnings over the last couple of years is like just get used to it, calm down and, you know, know that there is a plan. And as long as there is a plan and, you know, make make individual exceptions to any reorg uh, to suit particular teams where it doesn't make sense. Don't try to ever apply anything on a blanket level, um, but just be prepared for, for a lot of change and treat it like a design project. Let's, let's talk about that some more because, um, you know, as we talk to lots of different design teams, we hear the same thing that there's this constant reorganization, which is, uh, I mean, it's essentially, you know, to throw in another metaphor, it's like a snake shedding skin. You know, there's a lot of growth and you just have to fit into something new. Um, and people that do well um, in these high growth organizations, they figure out a way to navigate that. Because with each reorg, there's what we call FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Can you talk about how you have walked your team through that, that FUD, how you, you know, uh, help, help people feel a little bit more comfortable, a little bit safer in their role? Yeah, so I think, you know, this is not really specific to me, but Shopify in general. Um, we have uh, one of our core culture values is thriving on change. So we try to sort of lead by example when it comes to that and, and make that uh, something that we find ways to get the team excited about. Uh, so we'll always try to talk about what the new opportunities that any sort of reorg brings um, and then more on an individual basis, what we're always thinking about is, you know, when everyone hears about like some sort of reorg, the first thought is, you know, what does this mean for me? Um, should I be frightened about this? Does this mean I uh, have a new lead? You know, that's not always cool if they really like their lead at the moment. So um, we try to uh, talk to every individual person. Um, every time that there's a reorg that they're going to be directly affected by and anyone who's then indirectly affected, that's more of um, sort of mass communication. Uh, but like one-on-one -on -one I find is, is best uh, to sort of calm any fears, make sure people are excited about it, focus on the positive aspects of things, particularly if some things are not changing today, but in the future. So how how do you know, Lindsay, when it's time for, for a reorg and what, what's the catalyst for that? Yeah, that's a tricky one. I mean, it technically there's there's always a time for a reorg. <laughs> you know, something's always not right in the group. You know, no no organizational structure is perfect. You introduce problems as well as taking problems away. And so uh, our CEO likes to say it's just a different and hopefully better set of trade-offs. Um, so... You know, for us, a lot of it has been um, growth based. So uh, every time the team doubles, you know, the question arises, like, does uh, the group's setup work right now? We try to do a good bit of um, forward planning with individual leads to work out, you know, what does your team look like in the next 10 months? What's the growth going to look like? Who do we need to start 
thinking about for leadership roles now. How do we prepare them? How do we identify them? How do we work out who would be great? And um, sometimes that just depends on the growth of that individual team. And, and there's times when it's obvious. Sometimes it's because people are leaving or going to a different role in the company. Um, so sometimes there's like individual forcing functions like uh, like folks moving on or changing role. Sometimes it's a company level direction. Um, and sometimes it's something a bit more um, goal based, like, hey, we want the team to be more focused on overall output of their team and not just their individual discipline or something like that. Um, so for us, the, the catalysts have been actually different every time, but certainly all as a result of growth. So you've, you've seen a fair bit of organizational change yourself. Uh, in fact, we had a, a call a, a little while back and we talked about org structure and uh, kind of mapping that out. And then uh, I think maybe a week later, you called back and said, hey, everything we talked about, that, that actually just changed, um, which is typical. I mean, that's just, that's just what happens. So I wonder if you have any wisdom uh, about different organizational structures you've seen, centralized design teams, decentralized design teams, hybrid models. Um, of pros and cons of uh, that would be you know beneficial as as leaders are, are trying to figure out the right org structure for the place that that they are right now in, in their evolution. Yeah, um, so I guess what I will start by saying is I definitely won't claim to have gotten this right every time. Um, the thing that I've really learned in all of the research that we've done and some of our own changes and experiments is that. There's a, there's a huge risk in looking to any model and thinking that it's going to solve all your problems um, because it'll just get ripped apart the minute somebody uh, actually digs into it and tries to question it. So um, we've tried to look at other companies and take the parts that work for us. So be quite specific about what our specific objectives are um, as opposed to just kind of having a more general conversation around functional versus um, matrix or whatever. Um, so, so I think that's the biggest guidance I'd give to any other company is like, you can be sure anyone you talk to about this has also not got it completely correct. So don't worry too much about putting something in place that is going to be perfect. Think about your own company, what the business needs are there, what the needs are of the team, what sort of things you value, um, like, do you value a lot of individual-based behavior? Do you value a lot of team-based behavior? All of these things will determine how your structure ends up, but it is completely individualized to you. Um, and the other thing would be to try to look outside of tech as well. Um, the first mistake I made with trying to look at uh, my first reorg a, a while back here was uh, only looking at other UX and design organizations. And of course, that's not the only type of creative organization that exists in the world. Um, you know, you can look at architecture firms, building companies, all sorts of companies who have um, gone through this sort of growth or are operating huge creative teams um, and can give a good bit of insight to this too. And I'm curious, uh, you know, Shopify is at this point a pretty big company and you've got multiple locations. Um, is it four locations right now or... Uh, five even. We're in Montreal, five. Ottawa, Toronto, San Francisco, and Waterloo. Uh, so that that definitely makes things a bit more complicated when you've got teams in, in many locations. Yeah. How does that factor into the way that you think about organizational structure and the values you try to build in? Yeah, so we've had a distributed design team for a long, long time. Um, we have over 250 people working within the UX group now. And UX at Shopify means uh, front-end development, it means research, it means content strategy, and it means product and marketing design. So this is a large group of people distributed over five locations plus. Um, and we've also got some remote people for quite specific uh, niche roles as well. Um, so I guess the main thing that uh, that sort of growth and um, distribution has taught us is that there is really no one-size-fits-all for all of this. We've tried to have a general structure so people know what to expect. Um, but uh, largely, we've gone through a couple of uh, different variations of this involving having local leadership, having discipline leadership, 
um, having project-based leadership. And the thing we've found, I guess, is that not one of them is perfect, but it's best to try to have a bit of a mix there so that people have different sorts of leadership available to them, different role models um, and different people to lean on depending on what their individual needs are for growth and what the project and company needs to. Lindsay, uh, Shopify has this strong culture of, of servant leadership. Could you talk a little bit about what that means and maybe some of the advantages that it, that it gives to the company? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, coming into Shopify five years ago, this was one of the most refreshing things for me. Um, it's really, it's really nice to actually have um, a management and leadership team who have confidence in their team and their staff, um, so that it's not everything's di- not directive based. Um, and this is even like if you look at our um, organizational chart uh, on our internal uh, wiki. Uh, you'll see it upside down. Um, I think that kind of embodies some of the things that we're trying to go for, which is that, you know, if I'm not the best product designer that the team has, and I am certainly not, um, it's my job as a leader to make sure that the conditions are created for those people to do great work. Um, And as long as the culture of design is strong, the culture of solving problems for real people is strong, Uh, We do a good job of hiring the right people and creating the right mixes of personalities and skills on teams. Then it's really up to the team members to make the magic happen there. So where I get involved is if they're being blocked in some way. Um, But the reality is like we already know these people are brilliant. We trust them. So they certainly don't need me telling them where to put every pixel. Support for Design Better comes from Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery. Design Better listeners can save 50% on their order at factormeals.com slash designbetter50. Use the code designbetter50. You know what happens at my house when things get really busy? In the evenings, we turn to takeout, which can be expensive and it's not very good for our health. Lately, we're making a better choice at crunch time. We turn to Factor for chef-created, dietitian approved meals that are ready to eat in just two minutes. We like the flexibility of Factor, too. You can change your order up every week with plans from 4 to 18 meals per week. Or you can pause or reschedule your deliveries at any time. The meals are so tasty. My wife and I are huge fans. And I like their smoothies too, which I find are perfect for a quick, healthy breakfast. Factor can help you eat well and feel good while focusing on your career and your family. Head to factormeals.com slash designbetter50. And use the code DESIGNBETTER50 to get 50% off your order. That's code DESIGNBETTER50 at factormeals.com slash designbetter50 to get half off your order. Support for Design Better comes from Uplift Desk, who help you work better and live healthier. Eli and I log a lot of hours at our desks, which can be detrimental to one's health if you're not paying attention to ergonomics. Uplift Desk offer high-quality, well-designed desks, chairs, and accessories to help you build an ergonomic workspace for home or work. Eli recently got a standing desk, and I got a human-scale freedom chair. I've been dreaming about this chair for a long time, and I finally got one. I've already noticed a big change in my posture with this chair, and my body thanks me for it. Eli is logging a lot more hours standing than sitting these days, and he can make quick transitions with the flip of a switch. We love Uplift Desk, and we know that you will too. Design Better listeners can get a special deal by visiting upliftdesk.com and use the code DESIGNBETTER at checkout for 5% off your order. You'll get free shipping, free returns, and an industry-leading 15-year warranty. Go to upliftdesk.com, use code DESIGNBETTER, and get 5% off. Design a better workspace with Uplift Desk. Support for Design Better comes from Gusto who make running a small business easy. Get three months free at gusto.com slash design better once you run your first payroll. Running a small business is hard work, especially all of the payroll, quarterly tax filing stuff, and HR things. I'd rather be focused on my business and my customers than dealing with the administrative duties. But Gusto makes it easy. They automate the complicated parts of running a business. With Gusto, I never miss federal or state payroll tax filings. And I love the time off requests and time tracking tools. 
Gusto even offers a small group health insurance option for nearly any budget. When you run into issues you need help with, their HR experts are ready to help. It's a very well-designed product, easy to use, and great emotional design that will put a smile on your face. Design Better listeners get three months free once they run their first payroll. Just go to gusto.com slash design better. That's gusto.com slash design better. One of the challenges that we often see in design teams is that, uh, you know, they, they do a great job of hiring talented individual contributors mm-hmm. and their, their strong leadership up top. Uh, but before you know it, maybe someone exits or something shifts and there's not someone ready to step into a leadership role. How have you thought about developing a leadership pipeline and, and you know, coaching people up and giving people a career path to make the design team, the design org sustainable? Mm. Yeah, this is a really tricky one because I don't know that anybody's ever really ready to step up. Um, we have a tendency, I guess, due to the rapid growth that we've had uh, of putting people in roles slightly before they're ready. And I'll put my own hand up and say, I've been put in roles <laughs> before I'm ready too. Um, and there's pros and cons to that. You know, that's um, the sort of cycle of continuous change that we have going on here. So my, my view on that is that as long as it's supported change, it's okay to put people in an area that they're not feeling entirely comfortable with, as long as they know that um, they've got somebody watching their back, they can ask whatever they feel is a stupid question. They've got support from teams like HR who can help them with certain aspects. They've also got their lead. Um, but you know, when we're looking at people's uh, performance reviews on an ongoing basis, there's always conversations around, you know, what's this person's individual interests? What do they want to pursue? Do we start to prep them up for a leadership role, um, whether it's from the, the people side or whether it's from the technical side? Uh, all of those things are always being taken into consideration with every single individual um, who works here. So I feel like a lot of those things do get covered uh, by that person's lead. Um, and we see leadership everywhere here. I mean, it's it's evident in uh, project work. It's evident in craft level stuff. You know, what are they taking on? Um, by themselves? What are they really excelling at? What do they do better than anyone else? Can we help develop those skills further? Uh, I'm curious, Lindsay, is there is there an alternate track to, to leadership as well for uh, designers who want to remain individual contributors but want to advance in their career? Yeah, we, we have that, but truthfully, I think it could be a lot better than it is right now. That's actually something I'd like to work on this year. Um, we certainly have uh, very, very highly skilled and creative designers that don't have large teams, um, and you know they can uh, they can make it up to lead level, of course. Um, but that is something that I think we could get better at. We have the framework for it, but um, we're at the size now where we're seeing that this is actually a really important thing for a lot of people. We want to make sure that there's a place uh, for creative leadership that doesn't involve. Uh, scaling or running a large team as part of that. Um, so it's really important for me that we um, preserve a place for high, high levels of individual skill. Lindsay, this past year, Shopify did something pretty amazing. You guys published um, one of the most uh, robust and sophisticated design systems out there. And it's not just, you know, component library. Um, it's, you know, the philosophy of design at Shopify. It's, um, you know, how you write and speak through your, your platform, your interfaces, uh, really a complete system. So I wonder if you could give us the backstory of where that came from. What's the tipping point where uh, the company as a whole says, hey, we need to invest in this? Because I know you staff it like a product, not like a project too. So there was a significant investment. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was a monumental cross-team, cross-office, Shopify-wide effort. Um, So many things had to be thought of as part of this. So, I mean, I guess it originally spawned um, from the realization that over the years, our design styles and systems had really um, started to divert. And we'd ended up with a set of products that didn't feel like a family anymore. Um, So a branding exploration project began 
and Polaris really came out of that. Uh, so what we have today um, is a set of products that does feel like a family. And that certainly doesn't mean that every team needs to follow this by the book. Um, it's one of the really important creative aspects here is that uh, you're able to feel like you can challenge Polaris and suggest better patterns, um, even a different creative direction, if it makes sense. Um, but what it does give is uh, direction on the most basic aspects of, of product design here. Uh, so something that we've been quite conscious of as part of this is making sure that we position Polaris as the floor and not the ceiling. Uh, so if a pattern doesn't work for you, don't use it, make a better one, contribute it. That's really hard though, so I don't want to downplay that aspect. Um, it's definitely still a work in progress in our eyes, but it was um, definitely one of the biggest highlights of 2017 for the team. And what does governance look like in that scenario where, you know, you describe Polaris as the floor, uh, so people are welcome to come in and, and make suggestions and, and additions. But clearly, I mean, it's a big company, and if everyone's making suggestions, uh, a beautiful, well-considered, well-staffed system can become chaotic very quickly. So how do you govern it uh, and uh, prevent the sprawl? Mm, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we have um, UX reviews where, uh, that are sort of Polaris um, and patterns focused, where people can bring individual questions, concerns, challenges, um, and talk through the different aspects of the application of all of this. Um, and that's usually how, uh, how we keep that going in terms of the conversations and the challenges and the evolution of Polaris. We still got quite a lot of, of work to do here. We've got a, a full roadmap for it in terms of um, continuous betterment. Uh, but when it comes to the teams actually working together, there's definitely an open and honest discourse between the offices and the groups as to how, if, and when it should all be applied. What role, uh, Lindsay, does, does the design system, does this Polaris play for your team in uh, helping a, a large team like, like, like Shopify's team unite across many locations? Yeah, so I guess my view on, on um, one of the big benefits of Polaris for sure is that it takes some of the basic decision making away. It sort of speeds up the the quality and um, the velocity at which prototyping can happen, um, and it just helps the teams focus on the really big problems that they're solving and a little bit less on some of the UI details, so that they don't have to reinvent a calendar picker every time they go to use it. Um, and that's kind of really our our hope there. Of course, there's the the merchant facing aspect of this, which is that we always want Shopify to feel somewhat familiar, feel like the same family of products. Um, but when it comes to internal um, production efficiency, uh, that's the real benefit is that um, teams don't have to reinvent the wheel every time they're um, putting together a piece of a product flow. So Lindsay, your your career at Shopify is is interesting. I mean, you've been there for quite a while now. You mentioned five years. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Which in yeah. our industry is five years is a very long time. It is. It is. <laughs> and certainly has has uh, a lot has changed at Shopify in that that time period, including the types of things that you're doing today versus when when you started. Yeah, that's um, right. What are, what are the key learnings? Like what? Certainly, there's a lot that, that uh, you've learned, but um, what sticks with you the most as your career has changed and, and you've watched this company grow and evolve? I think one of the, the keys to success and why it's been such an enjoyable five years, you know, I think like most people starting out on a job, there's no way I started here saying I will be there in five years time. That's a... Uh, not a very modern uh, way to think about your role. Um, but the reason I've stayed at Shopify that long is uh, is really down to this sort of continual accelerated learning. Um, I am constantly getting thrown in the deep end in areas where I genuinely don't feel like I'm um, particularly competent. At. And, you know, every time you go through it, you realize that um, it's going to be fine and you're going to work it out and you come out 
the other end of these experiences feeling much stronger. Um, the attitude to continuous learning here is definitely one of the primary reasons that I think a lot of people do spend a lot of a lot of their time, like really, really important years in their career here that are incredibly valuable. Um, and it's because they're being given the opportunity to try new things that mightn't be acceptable other places. Um, they're being supported in their individual needs. Um, and also there's a very real and tangible aspect to the work that we're doing. You know, we try to bring the merchants that we build for into the workplace a lot. And there really is nothing like going into a retail store or going to see somebody who's running their business in their own home and hearing them talk about some of the barriers that have been removed for them because of some of the work that you've done. Like that's absolutely uh, gold for me, gold moments. Um, and it's definitely part of the reason that I'm still here is that I, there's problems that I will not leave before I've solved. Um, and those are multi-year problems, difficult commerce and business problems to fix. Uh, but like having a real opportunity to fix them and make a difference is, is uh, just fantastic. So since Shopify was was founded, what year was, was it founded in? It's been around for a while. It's 11 years old now. 11 years. So also that's a long time. That's like Stone Age in the tech, tech world. Absolutely. Um, the, one of the founders was a designer, uh, Daniel Wynand. Is that how I pronounce it? Yes, right? that's right. Um, and, and he was a chief design officer, uh, departed somewhat recently. But is that that founding DNA of design and the founding DNA, how has that helped the company? Yeah. So Daniel hired me originally. And uh, you're right, it's certainly no accident that design has a place at Shopify, given um, Daniel's early involvement. And he was here until last summer. So a 10 year career here. I feel really lucky about that. Um, he was an incredible advocate for design. Um, and given the founder aspect of his role, he really contributed more than just to the design org or the UX org specifically. So he was very involved in culture, very, very involved in HR and even office design. And um, so for me, what that set us up for is the expectation of incredible production quality everywhere. Um, and that's something that you'll notice if you ever come to any of our offices, and I hope um, shows up in the product on the other side. That's, you know, everything from lunch to our office to the quality of experiences that get shipped um, are very, very well through, thought through, right down to the details. Um, so that creates a sort of a breeding ground for good work to be done and a standard that I don't think we'll ever see slip because extremely high visual and experiential design is very normal here. So you mentioned that he, he even had a hand in the, in the office design. Maybe you could speak a little bit more about how you feel that the space affects the creative process, creativity. Yeah, sure. So the office design is all Daniel and not me, but um, the way our spaces are designed is to accommodate different types of work. Um, so first of all, uh, you know, the details aspect that I just mentioned, you know, when you're sitting in a beautiful space that is really, really well thought through, um, you're probably not going to produce a shoddy piece of work and think that that's going to be okay. So there's that element to it. Um, but more generally, we've got a, a really broad mix and each of our offices is different, but some of the, the commonalities are that we try to mix uh, sort of individual hideaway spaces for introverts. Uh, or for people who just actually want to get a bit of work done and a bit of peace, uh, mixed with a pod-based layout where we have teams um, co-located in the one spot. There's also a lot of social spaces, so every office has uh, some sort of a large community hall area where we do town halls and that sort of stuff. Um, and every, uh, every office, and, and most floors even in each office, have a different theme. So depending on your humor that day, you might want to sit in a different type of chair in a different type of environment. So um, I think it's really the flexibility and the, um, the high level of, of thought and creativity that goes into these offices that make them incredible. Always nice to work in a beautiful place. Oh, so much. <laughs> uh, so one thing I've noticed about Shopify uh, is that it's a very customer centric place. You were talking earlier about the, you know, you, those gold moments where you just 
feel great hearing how Shopify is kind of a big unlock for people where it generates revenue, it gives freedom. I mean, it's that's a very inspiring mission. Can you talk a bit about how that customer centric mindset permeates uh, the, the the structure or just the, the culture of the organization? Yeah. So it's kind of, it's everywhere. It's hard to, to pinpoint the exact parts. You know, we, we try our best to bring merchants into the conversation and this has been an ongoing, uh, this has been an ongoing evolution in the last five years. Um, you know, five years ago, I don't think we could legitimately have said that we had as much merchant focus as we do today. Um, so there has been a lot of work and appetite involved um, and even a, a change in our culture values uh, to reflect that over time. Uh, so what we do today is um, everything from bring merchants in for our town hall panels on a Friday, have them discuss their sort of biggest challenges, the things that are coming up for them in the year, their um, loves and, and hates for Shopify as well. We try to have them be very honest with us. Uh, we've got a fantastic support team. We've always had that. Uh, so that's kind of an element of um, customer centric behavior that is, has never changed here. Um, we have a huge research team. It's, it's over 30 people now. Um, and obviously their entire focus is uh, based on bringing merchants in. We've got um, what we call product support network, which is a group of people that are almost like extension of the research team in some ways. They're the bridge between the support team and the product teams. Um, and they're fantastic sources of uh, support-based feedback as well. Excellent predictors of issues too. Um, so, you know, they're, they're kind of everywhere. They're part of every conversation that we have. Um, and I, I hope we can continue to get better at that. We try to encourage people to get out of the office and go spend time with merchants as well. Everybody in the company, um, we've got a couple of of merchants locally in each of our office cities and everybody in the company is welcome and encouraged to go out and visit those specific merchants who've signed up and said that they're happy to welcome us in at any time uh, as well as just being completely free and open to to go visit anybody else that they want as well so one one final question for you here that we've been getting in the habit of asking our guests uh, any resources, books, or blogs that you found helpful over the years as you've you've honed your your leadership skills? Yeah, so I think early on for me, like some of the the classics, like "Don't Let Don't uh, Make Me Think" by Steve Krug and "Remote Research" by Nate Bolt were some like really defining books for me and helping me develop my personal opinion about UX and what I care about and what I don't. Uh, but definitely as times have changed, uh, I've started to uh, struggle a little bit, I think, to find resources that were as helpful as some of those early ones when you're, you know, taking in huge gluts of information. Your problems get a little bit more specific, I think, the more senior you get. Um, but I really, really loved Creativity Inc. by Ed Catmull, which is the Pixar story. Uh, that's book. just such a great book. and like such a fantastic example of, of leading a large creative team. Um, but really, I think now I, I focus more on uh, going or listening to individuals in the community who I really respect and admire. Um, you know, not purely uh, around uh, UX, but there's a podcast that's just launched called No You Go by Sarah Wachter Botcher and um, that we're really proud to be involved in as well. And that's more of a general conversation about uh, female leadership skills and uh, work-life balance. Uh, so there's a real mix in there, I think. What about you? What are you reading at the moment? <laughs> so I, one book that I just recommended to um, somebody I was speaking to at BlackRock, and it may not apply as much to the situation at Shopify since design's pretty well understood there, but um, or Orbiting the Giant Hairball. Have you read that one? Yeah, um, that's, a that's a really, Yeah, it's a, it's it's been around for a while, but it, it's aged well, I think. What about you, Aaron? Uh, what am I reading right now? Um, well, I'm reading uh, the the Walter Isaacson book about Leonardo da Vinci, and I find that uh, I often learn a lot about 
the things that I do professionally uh, from adjacent categories, from things that are are disconnected. And uh, yeah, just the simultaneous exploration, prototyping, scientific method. Uh, you know, I hear echoes of the work that that we do in design in uh, the way that he was thinking, you know, 500 plus years ago. So I find that really fascinating. Yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? And it's so true. I think in, in tech more generally, we we can be a bit arrogant on the side of, you know, oh, we're facing all these problems for the first time. That's right. Yeah, it's a bit of navel gazing that happens in our industry. And, you know, it's there's there's a long history that's that's uh, come before us, which is why it's great to hear, you know, you're looking to other industries too, architecture, animation, um, certainly a ton to learn from Disney and uh, other uh, highly successful organizations. Well, Lindsay, it's always a treat to talk to you. And, uh, you know, Shopify is such an inspiring organization and uh, the work that you're doing is uh, it's really great. So um, thanks so much for joining us on the Design Better podcast and sharing your wisdom. Thank you for having me.